The following is a special presentation of Faith to Live By in honor of Pastor H.H. H. Barber, who was promoted to glory on October 24, 2020. My text is Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. This great text is the defining statement of what has been called the Magna Carta of our faith. To St. Paul, the issues were clear. We sing blessed assurance, Jesus is mine, and have confidence of eternal life, because Jesus paid it all. Or we are still in bondage to the beggarly elements of this old world. The epistle to the Galatians, as you know, was written in defense of essential Christianity. St. Paul was totally convinced, as I am, that truth matters, that it matters tremendously what one believes. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14 was far more than simply Dad's preaching text that Sunday morning. It was his life text. But a kingdom man one who stood for the gospel and who made Christ known and understood to us all. And he never failed to invite people to come to the cross and find forgiveness and freedom in faith in Jesus Christ. All he really wanted for you is to know God in a personal way. The first question which is typically asked is, what does HH stand for? Herbert Hanbidge Barber. Herbert was my dad's dad's name, and Hanbidge was my dad's mum's maiden name. The Barber and the Hanbidge families had come in the mid-1800s to the Georgian Bay Area, Bruce County, Gray County, just outside of Owen Sound, Ontario, and there they would farm for several generations. My dad was born into a very humble farming home, but he received a very godly heritage. He was always proud of his grandfather, who had been a circuit-riding Methodist preacher. But dad was born June 23, 1922, and he would excel in his studies, so much so that he would go on to the University of Toronto for three years, receiving a Bachelor of Arts degree. During that same time in World War II, he would come for one year to Western Bible College in Winnipeg with his brother Paul. Dad would then return to Southern Ontario and, having finished his university studies, he would start working in Elmira, Ontario as a pastor. He would marry Mum. She was Margaret Elizabeth Betty Haynes, of Alora, and they would go to Elmira, and from 1945 to 1948, they would pastor. Dad's life sketch takes on a very similar pattern. In Elmira, they built a church building, they built a house, and Dad was on a radio station out of Kitchener. Then in 1948, it was on to Regina, and there, a house was built, a church building was built, and Dad had a radio program out of CKCK CK Regina every Sunday morning. In Elmira, my brother, my oldest brother, Lauren, was born. Then in Regina, my brother, John, and my sister, Linda, were born. In 1953, Dad received a call to come to Calvary Temple, Winnipeg, and he would serve there for 44 years. At first, there were some very difficult times at Calvary Temple. There was the threat of a church split, and that weighed heavily at first upon Dad. But he threw himself into the work, and very quickly there were church expansion projects taking place. There was a new youth camp established in the White Shell, eastern Manitoba, and many other things. During this time, my sister Sherry and I would complete the Barber family. 
Dad would, again, build many church projects. There was no house built there here in Winnipeg, but there were numerous long-standing radio and television outreaches, the best of them being known as Faith to Live By, which was begun January 1962. There were also daughter churches in the area, as well as at least a dozen ethnic outreaches into various languages that were sponsored by the work here in Winnipeg. Dad, in 1997, felt that at the age of 75, it was time for someone else to take on the leadership role of Calvary Temple that he had carried for so long. However, I don't ever remember him using the word retirement. Rather, he immersed himself in the leadership of a new endeavor that was the establishing of a personal care home, a 100-bed personal care home that he had dreamed about since the late 1960s. And then also, for the past 22 years, Dad continued with Faith to Live By and he saw undoubtedly his largest viewership, his listener audience, come into place and he had opportunity to continue a very powerful pulpit ministry. Dad and Mum celebrated their 75th wedding anniversary this past June and we were so delighted for them to have that privilege indeed the goodness of God. Dad was hesitant to write an autobiography or even to have anyone else write a biography on him. However, he finally relented and about a year ago he wrote a book of six sermons called Comfort and in the back pages, about 15 or so of them, he includes a number of memoirs. You might be interested to get a copy of Comfort Through Faith to Live By and to be aware of what that has to say. Here are several gospel ministers who have served in various ways with Dad. First of all, Reverend Robert Kremples, who I describe as a very youthful 101-year-old, will speak, and then other younger voices will come and also pay tribute to Dad. Friends, my name is Bob Kremples. I suppose through the years, Pastor Barbara has influenced thousands of individuals, but I doubt that he's influenced any outside of his immediate family more than he has me. You see, we first met when I was 34 years old, and he has always been just a couple of years my junior. But really, I don't hesitate to tell you that he was a man of much wider experience and ability than I. But he made a profound mark upon my life. I found him to be a man of character. And integrity is such an important component in the life of a servant of God. And then I found him to have great wisdom and wide experience and great vision. I would not long been at Calvary Temple serving as assistant pastor and minister of music when he dedicated the first education annex that was built to old Calvary Temple. Then a few years down the road, we broke ground for Red Rock Youth Camps, camps that made an impact upon my own son's lives when they attended. And of course, I'll never forget all the excitement that led up to the producing of the first program for faith to live by. Think of it. It was Pastor Barber that chose the format, chose the theme song, chose the essence of it, and started producing it and to this day it goes on more than 50 years later blessing so many lives he was a man of vision a man of action a man of character and i want to tell you he was a preacher par excellence Do you know that some of the sermons that he gave i still recall by title 
and I have been blessed in recalling the essence of them. These many years later, he polished them and loved to proclaim the word of God. But even more important than preaching was doing God's will, God's way. He was not spectacular. He was sound and solid. It's a great honor for me to speak on behalf of Pastor Barber. He was a personal friend, a close confidant of my father's. He was a great person within the broader evangelical community. And so as that, I bring you these greetings and these moments of reflection. My father was superintendent of the Pentecostal churches in Saskatchewan, and Pastor Barber was pastor of the Bethel Church in Regina. The story goes this way. My dad, who was superintendent, was like bishop of the province, so he was the senior. He told me one day he had called, and uh, Pastor Barber answered. And Dad said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm about to uh, post a letter to the Calvary Temple in Winnipeg saying I'm not coming. Dad, being his bishop, said, Herb, sit down. There's something I have to say to you. And as I remember Dad telling me the story, it was, there are moments in life when an opportunity comes that doesn't come again. I don't want to lose you from my province, but this is an opportunity for you. You must take it. That became history. Pastor Barbara went to Calvary Temple and became the pastor of Winnipeg. But he became more than that. He really became the Charles Spurgeon of Canada. His articulate preaching, his thoughtful messages, his speaking into the lives of people in their time uh, was a special mark of his preaching. Some years later, my dad died. He died at 61, and for our family, there was nobody but Pastor Barber that we wanted to preach that sermon. And so he came and he preached the sermon on Pilgrim's Progress, and he, he had the metaphor out of that to liken to my father. It was a marvelous statement. It was very accurate. He had the ability to, uh, Pastor Barber had the ability to speak at a funeral and speak into the, into the ethos and the pathos of the moment. And he did that for us as a family, but he did that for us as a denomination. Speaking of my father, who was a national leader. So as I reflect on the work and the world of Pastor Barber, I recognize that there are moments in a country, in a city's history, when certain people with skills and insights and capacities rise to the surface and provide definition for faith, provide insight into the culture and into the issues we face. My prayer is that Pastor Barber's ministry and life, his preaching, his elegance with words of taking the scripture and lifting it to a level of, of personal and corporate impact is something that we are in constant need of. My prayer is that this will be matched by young men and women as they rise to the call of the Lord will serve in such a way. For 10 years, I had the privilege to be on team with Pastor H.H. H. Barber at Calvary Temple, Winnipeg. That was way back in the 80s. From there, I was called out to Glad Tidings Victoria in British Columbia, where I became the lead pastor for 25 years. You might say I learned everything I needed to learn about pastoring and preaching from my mentor, H.H. H. Barber. Of course, he was the prince of preachers. In fact, he was at his best when he was preaching, aflame with the passion of his calling, vividly dramatic at times. He made you see things that were invisible his sermon, his delivery, his address, so human in its touch and charged with a depth of emotion and spiritual fervor that translated into real unction. 
I remember as he spoke, you would feel he understood life. But more importantly, you realized that he also knew something valuable about God. You could see he was always convinced of the truth of what he said. He was unwavering, and possibly that's why he never sounded dry nor flat, even to the uninitiated. He had this rare ability to garner everyone's attention. They were listening, even if they tried not to. It was his warmth sometimes, and sometimes it was his fire. He seemed to be able to touch every chord. At one time, he could be stern and austere as a Puritan. At another, beaming and congratulating his audience and congregation. I think his genius lie in his ability to make you a believer again and to call you back to the basics of Christian living and Christian experience, to make you understand what you should be, to make you believe what you could be, to cause you to desire what you ought to be, what God wanted you to be. He wanted you to know that you could trust God with your whole life. He had an eye for seeing things flat out and always brought an answering call to righteousness, whatever the circumstances. His passion and focus, of course, was always evangelism, for he understood the worth of a soul and his beloved and cherished theme always the cross of Jesus Christ. I am so very grateful for this opportunity to honor my dear friend and personal hero, Pastor H.H. H. Barber. I'm so thankful that he embraced Jan and me during the early years of our own ministry and welcomed us to Calvary Temple. And when we arrived, he and his wife invited us, including our twin infant sons, to stay in his own home while we waited for our house to become accessible. I'm so thankful that he gave me the opportunity, an amazing opportunity, to work and walk with him and for the invaluable time he spent with me, and especially our almost daily chats over lunch at Tim Hortons. I'm so thankful he visited and preached for me at my own pastorates over the years. One very fond memory occurred when he came to preach for me when we were in Orlando. On a very warm Florida summer afternoon, we had the joy of taking him and Betty to Disney World. Jan and I can never forget the sight of HHB and his sweetheart walking hand in hand through the crowds, and of course, he was wearing his gray suit, white shirt, tie, and black dress shoes, and he was turning eyes that were fully persuaded he was surely an executive director of the park. I'm so thankful that he gave me the honor of continuing over these many years to still be heard singing every week on Faith to Live By. And I'm so thankful he provided a sterling example of fidelity to his precious wife and unrelenting love to all of his family. I'm so thankful he was a clear reflection and extension of the heart of Jesus for the little, the youngest of our culture, the least, the forgotten of our culture, and the lost, all who have yet to come to faith in Christ. I'm so thankful he was passionate and unrelenting in his pursuit of the souls of men and women for the sake of the gospel. And he never failed to invite people to come to the cross and find forgiveness and freedom in faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful he presented the whole counsel of the scripture 
for common minds to understand, and he never compromised God's truth. A son of Calvary Temple is what Pastor Barber called me. My name is Alan Duncalf, and for 58 years, I have called him my pastor. He baptized me in the old Calvary Temple building. He discipled me through his anointed preaching and his example of godliness and exceptional fruitfulness. He preached at my wedding to Gloria 31 years ago, and for 26 years, I have been pastoring Cross Church, which he started in 1956. I and my church and my whole family owe him a debt of gratitude that we can never repay. When the Duncalf family came to Christ, we immediately signed up to serve. It was in serving that we discovered that our pastor practiced what he preached. I have heard him called Canada's Prince of Preachers, which I agree with. But I saw Pastor Barber behind the scenes, willing to roll up his sleeves to do the humblest tasks like plastering walls, doing the bulletin, removing graffiti, or swinging a hammer at his beloved Red Rock Youth Camp. He was a servant at every level. My fondest memories of my pastor are in the prayer room. When on Sunday nights after the sermon, Pastor Barber invited people to the prayer room, where along with the other pastors, he would roam through the room, laying hands on people and praying for them. I was just a teenager at the time, but I'm convinced that these precious times of prayer with my pastor shaped my life and set me on my present path. I'm an heir to a rich legacy, and in response, all I can say is thank you, Pastor Barber. I first met Pastor Barber in 1969 when I moved to Winnipeg. I had heard of his ministry and of the excellent music program at his church, so I joined. I soon came to appreciate his powerful preaching his focus on preaching God's Word, and his desire to preach the Gospel beyond the walls of the church through radio and television and evangelistic services. I joined the uh, music program of the church and was soon asked to sing in Faith to Live By. And I've been singing at, with Faith to Live By for 50 years. It's been a great honor to be a part of this ministry over all of these years. Shortly after settling down in Winnipeg, I experienced a personal crisis in my life. And Pastor Barber was right beside me through this difficult time. He became a firm support. That's when my appreciation for him became much more deep and personal. Many think of Pastor Barber as aloof and reserved. But in my experience, he stood right beside me when I needed him. He ministered to me, giving godly advice and support. I will always be grateful for the support and comfort he gave to me during that time. After retiring from Calvary Temple, Pastor Barber expanded the focus of faith to live by into a Canada-wide interdenominational ministry, Canada's Church Without Walls. The Lord has continued to bless and expand faith to live by under Pastor Barber's leadership and more recently under the direction of his son, Pastor Jim Barber. One song I love to sing is Find Us Faithful by John Moore. The chorus says, Oh, may all that come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our devotion light their way. Pastor Barber's faithful ministry over many years was that example to me. I'm so grateful to have known and to have worked with him over these 50 years. Dear friends, Dear family of Pastor Barber, we express our sincere condolences to you. We grieve. We share with you the grief that Pastor Barber has gone into eternity. We will miss him. We all understand that we needed him so much. Today he is not with us. He is already rejoicing there in heaven. He is with Christ, whom he loved so much. The grace of God has worked so powerfully through your Father. 
Through his ministry, so many people came to Christ in Ukraine, in Russia, in Belarus. Many thousands of people came and enjoyed the Word of God and strengthened their faith. Many people were baptized. Many children were blessed by Pastor Barber. He blessed our sons. For many people he prayed, prayed with tears for everyone who had a need. Many people were healed. It was a preaching of the grace and power of God. He blessed me for the pastoral ministry, for the Episcopal ministry, and it is so important and valuable for me to carry on the preaching of the gospel. And we praise God that we can carry on. Twenty-two books with the sermons of Pastor Barber have been translated into Russian and printed of more than 60,000 and are distributed to people. People read, thanks the Lord, they come to God when they read these books. These sermons are also a good example of preaching for the young preachers. I look forward to meeting with Pastor Barber there in heaven. We will meet and glorify the Lord and will never be apart. We are sincerely grateful to all of you, the family of Pastor Barber, Sister Linda, Pastor Jim, Brother Thor. We are so grateful to you for your participation in our ministry. May the Lord comfort your heart. May God bless you with love to you, Tambov Church, and all brothers and sisters. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore. Due to COVID restrictions, no funeral service was held for Dad. But on October the 28th, four days after Dad passed on to glory, my family gathered here in the historic Elmwood Cemetery, just across the Red River from downtown Winnipeg. We laid the casket down and I led in a few words of remembrance, scripture reading, and the committal. I used Dad's tattered old funeral service book saying, we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. How is it that we can be sure and certain? Because of the cross of Christ. The cross which Dad rejoiced in and proclaimed his whole life through. The world celebrates and glories in many things. The Apostle Paul had been down that dead-end road and had come to rejoice and glory in only the cross of Christ. I now invite you to glory not in any human life, but rather in the cross, that there might be for you also that sure and certain hope of the resurrection the finished work of Jesus Christ upon Calvary's cross is our confident trust and hope for heaven and life everlasting. Amen.